The Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank is set to sign its Articles of Agreement this month and be fully operational by the end of the year. What does that mean for Asia and more importantly you and me? That's today's conversation taking place in Asia now. So by the end of this month, it's expected that the Articles of Agreement for the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, or the AIIB, will be finalized and ready for signing. This China-led development bank also believes it will be up and running by the end of the year. So far, more than 50 countries have agreed to join this endeavor, including 16 of the world's top 20 economies. The four naysayers include the United States, Japan, Mexico, and Canada. Even so, the AIIB isn't the only game in town when it comes to developing this particular region where some 40% of the population are said to be poor. Returning to the podcast is Curtis S. Chin, Asia Fellow with the Milken Institute to help make sense of all this financial gobbledygook. Curtis, welcome back to the podcast. Great. It's always good to be here. Super. Now, before we dive too much into this topic, uh, could you really briefly bring us up to date, remind us what exactly a development bank is and what purpose they serve? Sure. Uh, great question. You know, it's always tough sometimes to answer these questions without using the word, say, development and bank. Uh, but, you know, a development bank is a financial institution uh, that's really focused on improving countries, economies, people's lives, and primarily, though, through building a country's infrastructure, you know, uh, or improving a, a country's rule of law. And so these are not institutions or banks that maybe you and I can go to and pull money out of from an ATM machine. Uh, development banks are really typically owned by a country or countries and typically lend to or do projects in other countries. So it's less of, you know, a consumer bank. It's really about helping countries get better, helping them develop. Okay. Now, in Asia, who are the major players when it comes to these financial institutions or development banks or what have you? Sure. I mean, the, the two that really come to mind are, of course, the World Bank. That's a Washington-based institution that was really created after World War II to help really finance infrastructure and development around the world. So a major player uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. Now, here in Asia itself, there's one based out of Manila called the Asian Development Bank. You know, people sometimes just say the ADB. But the Asian Development Bank is sort of an Asia version of the World Bank, and like the World Bank, is owned by countries and primarily lends to countries. But, you know, you, you raise a, a question that perhaps because uh, of the big news that's happened really this last couple weeks, which is there's a new player in town, and that would be the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB. And unlike the World Bank, which is really led by the Western countries, and you know, the United States uh, typically uh, uh, names the president in some ways, uh, the Asian Development Bank, also heavily influenced by Japan uh, and the United States, and the Japanese uh, typically name uh, the president there. The AIIB, this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, is different and, and perhaps a sign of a changing world and a changing Asia. It is a Chinese-initiated institution uh, that we based out of Beijing. And uh, uh, based on reports, hopefully we'll be up and running by the beginning of next year, if not the end of this. Right. Now, you, you actually have worked with the ADB before. And now we have stories coming out that the AIIB, the China-led bank, is going to work with the ADB and cooperate on the region's development. Now, I want to get your opinion, since you are really familiar with this, how alike or really how dissimilar are these two financial institutions and, well, are they doing the exact same thing or do they have a slightly different focus? You know, uh, for the AIIB, I, I think, what do they say? The proof will be in the, the tasting of the pudding. Uh, because, you know, uh, the leadership of the AIIB is still being chosen. I'm really, it's at a very early stage. You know, what's happened if we take a step back? The end of March was the deadline for uh, countries who wanted to be founding members of the AIIB uh, to let the Chinese know that they did want to indeed join. Uh, there was a recent meeting really in the last what uh, two weeks in Singapore where these uh, founding members got together really to begin to work out the details. And so your question really went into the details of what will the AIIB do, uh, how will it be similar, and how will it be different to the ADB and the World Bank. We really don't know. 
uh, if we take them at their word, if we take the leadership that's uh, there so far at their word, um, they are like the World Bank and the ADB going to focus on infrastructure. You know, there's a tremendous need for infrastructure in the Asia Pacific region. You know, there's one estimate that you know the this region Asia could benefit from another 800 billion a year uh, in infrastructure investment over the next uh, 10 years. And so I think all these banks are rightly focusing on the infrastructure gap out there. Um, but the AIB has also made clear that it will not be simply focused on poverty reduction, which is, of course, one of the reasons to be of both the World Bank uh, and the ADB. It'll be a little bit more removed in that they'll certainly argue, and I do agree with them in many ways, uh, that improving this region's infrastructure will also help fight poverty in this region. But, I mean, okay, so if everyone essentially is doing the same thing, trying to improve countries, why have so many different entities? Why not just pool everyone's money into one group and move forward as a collective entity? I think we have to recognize that the World Bank, the ADB, the uh, what we call bilateral, meaning uh, one on one, or one country to another country uh, institutions, these really are all political institutions. Uh, and so uh, the World Bank, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, even the United Nations, you know, uh, of course we all say they're here to help the world, and indeed they are doing some marginal good, I would say. But the reality is that they are political institutions here to advance uh, the major shareholders, uh, their founders' goals. And so that's really one reason why there are so many of these institutions. Everyone has their own. Uh, country-specific goals above and beyond the regional regions that we would all like them to get together. Okay, so if we turn our attention back to Asia, Japan is the only major Asian economy that didn't join the AIB, yet they've also pledged a whole ton of money to try and improve the infrastructure of several Asian countries here. Now, what's your take on that? Why not just, instead of trying to go at it alone, you know, why not just either join the AIIB or, you know, put that money in the ADB? You know, clearly uh, Japan was in a bit of an awkward situation uh, in that uh, they recognize that this AIB is also a very political institution. In essence, it's China's uh, big bid to rival uh, the Japan-led Asian Development Bank. So you can understand from a political viewpoint, from a China-Japan viewpoint, why Japan might not have wanted to join. You know, and in some ways, it's been great, the AIIB already, without having even done anything on the ground, in that it has forced the ADB and other institutions to become, I hope, a little bit more competitive to focus on results on the ground, to be more efficient. You know, the AIB, you know, people have criticized for a variety of reasons, but I would say let's also recognize that the AIB, just by its very existence, can do something very positive, which is the push for improvements. You know, competition is good if it is not competing to race to the bottom. And so when we talk about the World Bank, the ADB, you know, all these institutions, uh, what they need to do is continue to focus on doing what they do best. You know, perhaps it's infrastructure, perhaps it's other kinds of programs. But in doing what they do, they need also to think through how do we get rid of the bureaucracy, all those things that hold back development in the region. You know, I say to people, the solution in reality is not one more financial institution. And let's hope the AIIB is a positive contributor to development in the region. The real solution to developing Asia is focusing again on rule of law, good governance, um, and really promoting an environment where business, the private sector can succeed. Right, your small bricks you're always talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. And for those of you who don't know, and let me repeat it for you. You know, what I see, you know, people always ask me since I left the board of the Asian Development Bank, you know, who will be that next, you know, economy that will kind of drive uh, the world, capture imaginations. And I say it's not going to be one more big brick, Brazil, Russia, India, or China. It's going to be a country that gets a handle on that little brick, that bureaucracy, the regulation, the interventions by government, and the corruption that too often holds back all too many economies. And I would say even the United States, we need to get a handle on the little brick and set an example for the the rest of the world, including Asia, on how we can move economies forward. Well, I mean, let's talk about corruption because, I mean, Asia has a reputation for being fairly corrupt. I mean, whether it's the AIB, the ADB, the World Monetary Fund, the IMF, you know, what have you, as we see more money coming into Asia for development for these other programs, do you think corruption is waning or do you think it hasn't changed? I mean, what's your take? Is money going to get where it's needed? Well, you know, first let me push back and say okay. that, you know, Asia is so broad. Uh, uh, you know, if you think about some of the least corrupt places in the world, they're actually in Asia, whether it's tiny little Singapore or New Zealand. You know, uh, so, you know, let's not say, you know, Asia is so corrupt. 
Clearly, there are corrupt nations in Asia, but there's clearly corrupt nations all around this world of ours. Absolutely. But you're talking about more money uh, coming into Asia and what happens to it. Indeed, that means more opportunities for big corruption. But sometimes, you know, when I'm in the field, I'm meeting with people in China or, you know, Papua New Guinea or wherever my travels may take me, you'll find that what, you know, really harms so many people is actually also the little corruption. So big money or, or small money, I think the bigger issue is can we have a rule of law put in place that will allow, whether it's the small time investor uh, or a much bigger investor, to say, hey, it makes sense to invest in this country and it's going to move forward because it's put in place that environment where business can develop it. And so, you know, the AIIB, the World Bank, the ADB, they will do a disservice if what they do is almost provide a crutch to countries to say, well, I don't need to reform because you're going to give me some more money. And so I think this is the bigger issue for the region. You know, we focus so much on these development banks, and that is the news. It's a sign of China's rise. But my hope as China rises is it will also get a handle on how it, too, can improve its economy and address issues like corruption, good governance, uh, and transparency. You know, I, I don't want to say I laughed, but I certainly noted uh, in the big news from this week in the world of sports was the big corruption oh, in uh, FIFA, absolutely. playing out uh, in the world of the World Cup uh, at FIFA. And how before the uh, FIFA president Blatter announced his intent uh, to have an election, so I don't think he's quite resigned yet, uh, Africa and the Asian nations were kind of clear, we're standing behind you. Uh, and so me, it's a sign less about just FIFA, but it's more about the need to challenge the status quo. And so we talk about Asia and development. I think it's a great thing that the ADB, uh, the World Bank, and other longtime institutions are being challenged. You know, my, I might not like the way they're being challenged, but certainly Asia can benefit by a little bit more competition across the board, whether it's in a fight for improving economies or just to improve that little project down the street uh, that could use a little bit more competition. Okay, now one last question. I think this is probably perhaps even the most difficult. You know, a lot of the money that goes into these development banks comes from state parties. You know, they make their contributions and they come from the state coffers, meaning that tax dollars are in play. So for the average person of, say, you know, South Korea or Australia or even England, who's a member of the, the AIB and, and, you know, United States for, sure. for other monetary funds, you know, the question that they ask is really what's in it for me? Why not spend that money on domestic issues where it's you know, also needed? You know, that's a very fair point. You know, this time when economies are troubled, we have slow to no growth economies. People want to say, why are you sending that money outside? Why do you help us here at home? I think it's a very fair question. Now, let's take a, take a step back, though. When we think about these development banks, the reality is in many ways right now, they're kind of self-funding in that the money they lend out comes back to them to finance future operations. But you have, uh, you've hit the point as to should they be bigger? And if indeed they get bigger, that means indeed more money that comes from someone's tax dollars to to increase the capital base. You know, I would say to the people who have concerns, uh, a couple things. One, you're absolutely right. You know, we need to focus on wherever our home is and make these better places. Absolutely, I agree with that. But I also say that helping other countries also has benefits at home. You know, clearly when I look at the United States, you know, uh, my home, uh, it's benefit from free trade from a growing world economy, and that's also what these institutions are about, growing uh, economies, uh, not just in one country, but around the world. Because clearly, if we've got more consumers around the world uh, at higher income levels, it means more products uh, uh, will be purchased, more trade. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd say to people when they think about uh, how these institutions can benefit at home. I remember when I used to testify uh, before the U.S. Uh, Congress, uh, one of the questions that would always come up uh, was that very specific one. You know, why should we give one more dollar to whatever institution overseas? Uh, and that's where data matters. And if you look at the data, you'll see that when we put money uh, into uh, exports, more jobs are created at home. We put money into uh, a place like the Asian Development Bank. The reality is that American companies, uh, American you know advisors, consultants, uh, Americans are also benefiting. That you know we get more money back than we put in. But clearly, it's a very important question. But I would say it's not an either or. I believe we can focus on home and also focus on improving uh, and uh, increasing the impact. Uh, of the World Bank, uh, the ADB, and some of these other institutions. And that's for me one reason I felt that the United States, Japan, other countries choosing not to uh, join the AIB 
was a lost opportunity. Let's try and shape and influence these institutions so indeed they can do a much better job uh, in the region. All right, Curtis S. Chin with the Milken Institute, thank you once again for joining us. Always great to be with you. Now, before I go, I'd love to hear from you. How do you feel about governments using tax money to fund international development efforts? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments on Facebook or Twitter. Asia Now is a featured excerpt from the Asia News Weekly Podcast, which is released every Friday. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is free, and when you do, the next episode is delivered automatically to you. You can subscribe on our website, asianewsweekly.net, or in your favorite podcast application. You'll be able to keep up with more news from the region by following Asia News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, be sure to drop us a line. The email address is podcast at asianewsweekly.net. Thank you so much for joining us today. Until next time, remember to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.